Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we're back with a discussion of the renal system, and this is part two. Now we're going to talk about some of the more commonly encountered diuretics. And the first class of diuretics are called loop diuretics. The most common is furosemide, also called Lasix. But there are other related drugs like torsemide, which is Demodex, and bumetanide, which is Bumex. These drugs all work in the same way. They prevent reabsorption of sodium in the thick ascending limb of Henle's loop, which is one of the anatomic structures we saw in the diagram of the renal tubule. In that part of the nephron, there are sodium-potassium ATPase pumps, which pump sodium, potassium, and chloride out of the urine. And the loop diuretics probably bind to the chloride site. About 25% of the sodium and chloride that is reabsorbed from the kidney is reabsorbed at this site. So a very large salt load is removed from the urine here, and therefore large volumes of urine can be controlled, either kept in the renal tubule or removed from the renal tubule, depending on whether a diuretic is given at this site or not. Loop diuretics are the first line treatment for acute congestive heart failure. This occurs when a patient's heart is unable to pump blood strongly enough, and there starts to be a backup of fluid first in the left heart and then backing up into the pulmonary circulation. So patients who have congestive heart failure may have pulmonary edema, which is fluid buildup into the lungs, and then if it continues, the swelling will back up all the way into the peripheral vasculature, leading to swelling and peripheral edema. When we give a loop diuretic, we decrease the patient's total body water, we decrease the amount of volume in their vasculature, and we help alleviate the congestion. Side effects of loop diuretics are easy to predict. Because they block the reabsorption of sodium, we expect the patients will become hyponatremic. And potassium is also lost, and so they will become hypokalemic. And of course, hypovolemia is a side effect if we overdiurese the patient. Now, we should be very clear about one point. Diuretics may increase urine output, but not all patients with low urine output need diuresis. And if a patient is hypovolemic and then you go ahead and give them a diuretic, you could actually injure the kidney and cause an acute renal dysfunction. You can decrease blood flow not only to the kidney, but you could actually decrease blood pressure and blood flow to all of the vital organs, which could lead to ischemia of the brain, of the heart, of the digestive organs, and of the liver. So diuretics should only be used in cases where we feel that the patient is volume overloaded, not just because urine output is low. Some say that loop diuretics have a cross-sensitivity with sulfa allergy, although in my practice, usually we give them to patients with sulfa allergy unless there's a very severe reaction. Loop diuretics also have some risk of ototoxicity, injury to the cells in the ear. Typical dosages of loop diuretics start between 0.1 and 1 milligrams per kilogram and can vary a lot depending on whether the patient is diuretic naive or whether they already have been taking diuretics previously. A closely related group of diuretics are called the thiazides, and the most common is hydrochlorothiazide, also called HCTZ. This drug also blocks reabsorption of sodium and chloride in a slightly different part of the kidney, the distal convoluted tubule. But the result is very similar as with loop diuretics. We have losses of sodium, potassium, and chloride, as well as some bicarbonate. And again, because of the large sodium gradient that occurs in the distal tubules, we have excretion of potassium as well. Hydrochlorothiazide is also is often given in combination with another agent. So you may see patients on a combination drug that has hydrochlorothiazide and another drug as well. Thiazides are usually given by mouth and can be used in treatment for hypertension, volume overload, and pregnancy-associated edema. The initial effect when these drugs are started is probably due to decreasing the extracellular volume, but over time, patients seem to develop some peripheral vasodilation, and that's why it works as a good antihypertensive drug. Patients will diminish their peripheral sympathetic activity, and as their total body stores of sodium decrease, 
we'll see more of this action. And that's why, again, it's a good anti-hypertensive drug in some patients. Side effects of these drugs will be similar to the loop diuretics. Hyponatremia, hypovolemia, some orthostatic hypotension, and this will lead to a hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. Other more uncommon side effects would be pancreatitis, hyperglycemia, diarrhea, and aplastic anemia. Before we move on, take a moment to jot down any questions you might have. Please drop me an email or bring them to class with you. So far, most of the drugs we've talked about involve losses of free water together with sodium. And most of them have the side effect of losses of potassium as well. But there's a subset of diuretics which are potassium sparing diuretics. These include amiloride and triamterene, and you may see these drugs especially in combination with other drugs. They block epithelial sodium channels and prevent sodium reabsorption, so there's your diuretic effect. But they inhibit secretion of potassium into the distal renal tubules. And so a lot of the potassium losses that occur with other drugs are blocked with the potassium sparing diuretics. And so often they make for a good combination together with other diuretics. Because if we give a loop or a thiazide diuretic, which causes losses of potassium, together with triamterene, which prevents losses of potassium, we may get a nice balance. And so we see drugs like maxide or diazide, which have these combinations. Side effects will still include hyponatremia, but depending on the combination, you may actually see hyperkalemia. Either way, in patients with diuretics, we certainly will want to keep a close eye on their electrolyte status. And that's true for all diuretics. Another set of potassium sparing diuretics are the aldosterone antagonists. This brings us back to a diagram which we've spoken about earlier, and I'll just review it again. This is the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone axis. It begins with synthesis of angiotensinogen in the liver and renin in the kidney. And renin facilitates the conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is then converted to angiotensin 2 by means of the angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE, which is synthesized in the lungs. Angiotensin II already has some actions, including vasoconstriction and water retention. And it also acts on the adrenal glands to stimulate secretion of aldosterone. And aldosterone, as we know, has the job to save sodium and p-potassium. So it's involved in sodium and therefore water retention, as well as excretion of potassium. Spironolactone is one of the most common aldosterone antagonists. And again, by inhibiting aldosterone, so that means it works right here and it blocks the effect of aldosterone on its target organs. It inhibits reabsorption of sodium and it causes retention of potassium. Drugs like spironolactone are commonly used in patients who have volume overload due to heart failure or cirrhosis. And the side effects include hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and also gynecomastia, enlargement of breast tissue in both men and women. And this is probably due to the fact that aldosterone and uh, aldosterone is a steroid. And so there may be some effect on steroid hormone receptors. That's it for our discussion of diuretics. Please let me know if you have any questions, and we'll look forward to discussing them in more detail in class with you.